The question this morning is, do you want to see what the Holy Spirit does when He moves powerfully through a new baby church, especially when He starts with the leaders of that church? I ask you again, do you want to see what happens? And if, even if you don't, we're going to see it anyway, so <laughs> I want to see it, and I get to preach today. So, uh, but I hope you want to see what happens, too, when the Holy Spirit rocks a new baby church and especially starts with their leaders. Turn in your Bibles to Acts 13. Acts 13. If you don't have a Bible, grab one of the white Bibles from underneath your seats. And we will go to Acts 13. We finally made it into Acts 13. Almost halfway there. We're going to take a summer break. Don't worry. But it's been exciting. And then, Lord willing, we'll finish up Acts in 2025. The year 2025. No, I I hope not. Uh, That was a joke. Uh, 2019. Okay. Acts 13. Acts 13. Let's just read verse 1 through 5, 1 through 5, just five verses today. Verse 1 says, Now there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manan, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. Verse 2, While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. And look at verse 3. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. Last verse, verse 5. When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, and they had John to assist them. This is the word of the living God. Now, we've been looking at Antioch. We've been looking at what God has been doing, and Antioch had a short pause, and we saw uh, God kill a a self-exalting king, and now we see the gospel still moving. Why did God drop the death of Herod right in between the gospel activity of the church of Antioch? to show that nobody is going to stop his gospel, even an angry, murderous king. And so we pick back up in the book of Acts. Now, now notice Antioch, if you don't remember, it was a new gospel-spreading church, right? And it was the first non-Jewish, quote-unquote, minority church. And the sweet thing about the book of Acts The sweet thing about the church of Antioch is this. The church of Antioch was the first church to send out missionaries. Did you realize that? What we are seeing in Acts 13 is a glorious thing. This church was serious about the last words of the risen Savior. They took the Great Commission seriously, Tisha. And they sent out Saul and Barnabas. In one way, yeah, we owe our salvation to these people. Now, we know that God saves us, but humanly speaking, if these people didn't send out missionaries for the first time in history, we would not have gotten the gospel and we would be dead in our sins. So we need to praise God for Mama Antioch. This is Mama here, the mother of missions. And so, they took the gospel beyond their little fellowship to reach their neighborhood and to reach the nations. Wouldn't that be a glorious reputation for City of Joy? That thousands of years from now, if Jesus doesn't come back, Thousands of years, people would be in a room somewhere celebrating that there was a church called City of Joy Fellowship, that people would be in heaven celebrating that City of Joy Fellowship, like Antioch, took the last words of Jesus seriously, 
that we would be a church, a gospel spreading. Can you say gospel spreading? spreading. One more time. Gospel Gospel spreading. They were a gospel spreading new baby church. I pray for that reputation for City of Joy. These people are crazy at City of Joy. They're like Antioch. They're a new baby church, but they're serious about spreading the gospel. I mean, have you heard about what's happening at City of Joy? Don't you want that reputation? The gospel has spread to Eastside High and Lincoln Middle School. The gospel has spread to Clark, and the gospel has spread to the Hole and the John D. Shields, and the gospel has spread to the Velts, and the gospel has spread to the South End and Washington Park and the Cahokia. Man, the gospel has spread through JJK and through CAC, and the gospel has spread through R3 and and through the Charter School, and the gospel is spreading through that church. They're, They're small, little church, but like Antioch, they have a reputation of filling the city with their gospel. This is their reputation. There are not a lot of deep, scholarly, older, mature believers at this church in Antioch because it hadn't been around long. So, because I know many of us want this to happen in the city through our new baby church. The Holy Spirit has some powerful things to say that resulted in the spreading of the gospel through Antioch, through that new baby church, and that we pray will result in the spreading of the gospel through City of Joy, through this new baby church. And so, I want to look at five graces of a gospel-spreading church, right from these verses. Not making nothing up, I'm just looking at these verses. May the Spirit inflame us into gospel action. Number one, what do we see? The first grace of a gospel-spreading church is that they are Christ-like. Can you say that with me? Christ-like. They're Christ-like. We talked about this a few weeks ago. According to uh, Acts chapter 11, verse 26, it says that the disciples were first called Christians at Antioch, and they were called Christians by the city, not by each other. I mean, they weren't just sitting down, hey, Mike, hey, 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 AP, man, hey, well, you think we should call ourselves Christians? Let's call ourselves Christians. No, no, the community called them Christians. For the first time in history, that name was not given to them by God. That name was not given to them by one another. That name was given to them because of their citywide reputation. Christians, what, which means at least a couple things. According to Acts eleven twenty one, these ex-hellbound sinners believed the gospel and turned to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what it says in verse 20. Why would they, how can you become a Christian? Verse 21 of chapter 11 says, they believed the gospel and turned to the Lord Jesus Christ. They believed. I just want to pause and ask y'all, do you believe the gospel? That's what makes you a Christian. I mean, think about it. Do you believe that God is real? Do you believe that God so loved wicked people like you and me that He sent His only Son who enjoyed the presence of the Father, Son, and the Spirit for all eternity? Do you believe that Jesus Christ was born of a teenage virgin who didn't have a sexual relationship with any man but the Holy Spirit just put Jesus in her stomach? Do you believe the gospel that Jesus came forward and lived a sinless life? Do you believe that? That's what makes you a Christian. That's why they were Christians. They believed that Jesus lived a perfect life in their place, and they believed that Jesus did nothing but good and healed and cast out demons. They, they believed that Jesus was forsaken by all of his closest homies. They, they believed that Jesus was beaten until he was not recognized. That's what made them a Christian. They believed that Jesus' back was ripped open and pressed up against a tree, and he became a curse for us so that we could be blessed forever. They they believed that on the third day that tomb was empty. Do you believe that? They believed that. 
And the Bible says it caused them to turn from their sin. When you believe that, your life that you live all of a sudden feels dirty, ugly, stinky, and you just turn away from it, and you turn to Jesus. That's, that's the first sign of a church that spreads the gospel in their community and in their world. It's made up of real Christians who really believe the gospel, who really have a testimony of turning from sin to Jesus. I pray that you do. Today, right now, you can believe the gospel. Maybe you thought it was a myth. Maybe you thought it was made up. Maybe you don't understand. But in this moment, the Holy Spirit is teaching you, man, Jesus really died, man. Jesus really rose. Trust him. And Lord, would you do it now in Jesus' name. But not only that, but not only that, another reason these believers in Antioch were called Christians is real simple. Somebody tell me now. Any English teachers in the house? You don't even have to be an English teacher. I, I guarantee you, you can get even, even my next up. You, what's the, what's it called? Root word of the word Christian. What's the first word? Christ. Christ. The reason they were called Christians is because the people in Antioch worshiping all these other gods, they started seeing these group of people living and loving like Jesus did when he was on the earth. And they was like, look at these little Christs, these little Jesus mini-me's just walking around doing all this stuff I, we've heard that Jesus does, like love people and serve people and tell people about turning from their sin and trusting in Jesus, and, and they're helping people and helping the poor. Man, these are Christians. Listen, this is not deep. One of the number one ways that you change your hood and your world is just to be like Jesus. They didn't have a doctorate degree in theology. They didn't go to school. They didn't go to Bible college. They didn't go to seminary. The church wasn't around long enough to have mature Christians. These were full of people that just wanted to be like Jesus. God. He uses people who just want to be like Jesus. I don't want to be a theologian. I don't want to be deep. I don't want to be a part of a denomination. I don't want to be religious. I don't want to just go to church. I just want to be like Jesus. Can you use me, Lord? Yes. Christians. God uses Christians, not Baptists and Methodists and Calvinists and Arminians and all of these other sects. He uses people who have turned from their sin, who cling to the cross, who believe the tomb is empty, and just want to be like Jesus. That's who God is looking for. He sent his first missionaries to put a, a dent in the kingdom of darkness and spread the gospel it's just through Christians. One of my spiritual heroes named Robert Mary McShane, this is what he said. I love this quote. Uh-oh. I love this quote. He says this. Now, I don't quote a lot of people, so it must be important, <laughs> I hope. McShane says, quote, it is not great talents God blesses so much as great likeness to Jesus. It is not great talents. Oh, that boy, he's skilled. Oh, he can. No, no. She's like, Jesus, watch out, East St. Louis, because there's a woman in this city that wants to be like Jesus, and God changes cities through women who want to be like Jesus. There's a teenager in this city that just wants to be like Jesus. There's a child in this city. There's a young brother in this city that just wants to be like Jesus. He wants to be a Christian. God changes the world through Christians. So that's number one. Number one grace is that they were Christ-like. But number two, number two, number two. The second grace of gospel spreading church is that they are co-missional. Maybe you heard that word, maybe you haven't, but I'm asking you to repeat it. Can you say it? Co-missional? 
commissional. I thought I made up that word, Terrence, until I Googled it, and a lot of people then said that, so that's okay. <laughs> I don't have to be original. I just need to be biblical. What does that word mean, though? Commissional. Comes from two words, right? Co -mish co two together mission. These people were commissional, meaning they was together on mission. Brad, can I get you for a second, man? You was in youth ministry? Sure. So you used, you used to just grabbing people. And just, here, here, lock with me. Okay. Lock with me. All right. Chocolate and vanilla. That's how I swirled up. That's how the Lord like it. You may not, but that's, you got to get over it. Chocolate and vanilla. Swirled up. Locked up. Look at him. You strong, bro. This is how they were for the gospel. Locking arms on mission, taking the last words of Jesus seriously. Let me show you. Thanks, bro. Thanks, bro. Look at verse 1. It says, now there were in the church, the church, in the church. It didn't say, now there were at the church. No, it didn't say they were at the church. Oh, he was at the church. No wonder he was at church. No wonder God, you, no, no, no. He was in the church. He was a part of the body of Christ by faith. And then verse 3 says that the Spirit sent them. Sent. And then verse 5 says that they proclaimed the Word. So it says that when God changed the city and the world, He uses the church, plural, a collective of believers, he uses them and he sends them. Like, Christians in this room have been sent. You have been sent. Man, that should make, man, when I found out I was sent, you are not just here. You've been sent. You're on a mission. Jesus is going to ask you, like, what did you do? I sent you to tell people about me. And when he comes back, we're going to have to tell him what we did, with what he sent us to do. We've been sent to do what? Proclaim the word. Proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. They didn't first think about, like, what about us? And what about our family? And what about our comfort? And what about our house? And what about our kids? And what about this? Those are important. But, but, but they first had this identity as a people of God that we're locking arms and we are on mission to speak the gospel of Jesus Christ. They had this mentality like, we have been saved and we are sent to tell as many people as possible about the urgent and amazing message of the gospel. That's why when you became a Christian, Jesus didn't zap you right up into heaven. He left you here and he sent you and you live where you live and you play on the team that you play on and you're at the school that you're at and you're in the family that you're in and you're on the block that you live on because you've been a missionary sent. And God created this city of joy fellowship so we can lock arms and be about this mission. Because we have a missionary God. Now, now if anybody could have been comfortable saying, I'm chilling on my throne, it was Jesus. It's like, no, I'm just chilling right here, high and lifted up, exalted, with burning creatures, bowing. No, 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 because God is a missionary God. Jesus was sent to seek and save the lost and to save you and me from going to hell. And he rose up and the Holy Spirit was sent. So the Father is a sending God who sent Jesus. Jesus is on sending mission who came to seek and save the lost. Then the Father and the Son sent the Holy Spirit into the church. And then the Holy Spirit has sent the church into the world. We are a sent people, sent by a sending God. We're not a chill, watch TV, chill out and waste my life, people. The Holy Spirit is always moving you as a mighty river towards unbelievers. If the Holy Spirit is not always moving you uh, to unbelievers, either you're not a believer or you're an expert at grieving the Spirit. There are no two, two differences. If you are a Christian 
And if the Holy Spirit is not constantly moving you towards unbelievers to give them the hope of the gospel, you're either not a Christian or you become an expert at quenching the Spirit. And whatever that case may be, Lord, give us grace to follow the flow of ascending God. Just ask yourself this question. This is what I ask myself. Are you living a missionary lifestyle? I have to ask myself that, Brett. Do you just come to church, get a good sermon, yeah, maybe, or uh, good people, definitely, uh, good this, good that, and then going home? That's why I was praying earlier. No more sermons and just sermons and songs, Lord. And a few highs and goodbyes, and I'll see you next week. That's not the church. That's called a club. The club at JJK. We ain't the club at JJK. We've been sent. It ought to feel like any, anybody ever been out of the country on a mission trip, not just a vacation, on a mission trip, several. When you wake up in the jungles of Honduras, in the Copan Mountains, it feels like you on a mission. Like, God wants us to wake up. I know it's hard, because we got nice houses and nice all He wants us to make, wake up like we're out in the jungle somewhere. This is not our home. Lord, teach us to wake up like, okay, Lord, who am I going to tell about the greatest news in the world. I'm going to get with you, Lord. I'm going to sing. I'm going to pray. I'm going to fight my battles by singing like Mark taught me. And I'm going to go out there and I'm going to tell the world about you because I'm sent. May City of Joy be a sent people on mission together. So that's, one, that's two. So number one, God spreads his gospel through believers that simply seek to be like Jesus. Number two, God spreads his gospel through believers that, that lock arms and realize that we're missionaries together. And number three, the third grace of gospel spreading church is that they are diverse. Can you say that with me? Diverse. Now it makes sense, right? They were the first non-Jewish congregation. The rest of the world was not Jewish. God in his wisdom saved and put together a group of diverse people to send them to a diverse world. And you see it right here. Do you see it? Look at verse 1 with me. I'm not just making that up. Verse 1 says, now there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manan, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. So follow this. You got at least three categories of diversity. In this, that little verse, you got spiritual diversity. You see that? Look, it says prophets and teachers. Prophets and teachers. This was not just a cookie cutter, and it's just highlighting the leader. The whole church we see from the previous chapter is diverse, but this is just highlighting the leadership. So, James, we got prophets and teachers. This wasn't just a cookie cutter. Everybody has the same gift. Everybody just talks the same. And this person gets up and he says, hello, everybody, good morning. We, and then the next person, hello, everybody, good morning. And then the next person, hello, everybody, good morning. Or then, the, you know, the, the person's just like, hey, everybody, hey, everybody, how's everybody doing? Then the next person, hey, everybody, like, everybody, no, no, no. There's different, there's prophets who are speaking forth the word of God with precision and insight right into the heart. And then there are teachers who explain the truths of the Scriptures and what they mean. You need both. You need prophets and teachers. But not only spiritual diversity, you also see ethnic diversity. Right here on the leadership. Ethnic diversity. So, so Barnabas and Saul, they are Jewish. Barnabas and Saul are Jewish. And then you got Simeon called Niger, 
Uh, and there are some countries in Africa. That you, can you think of any countries in Africa that start with N-I-G? Niger and Nigeria. Shout out to Zach Chike in the house with some Nigerian background. You know, this, this comes from a Latin word, and Zach may know this, I don't know, but the Latin word means black. The word Niger means black. This means black. So you got some Jewish dudes, you got a black dude from Africa, and then you got Lucius. Now you know he's black, just his name, Lucius. Lucius. My dad had a friend named Lucius. I knew he was black, right? When I, no, just uh, let me come back. Um, but he was from North Africa. He's African. Serena is in North Africa, and then Manan is Roman. Roman. Shout out to Italy in the house. Shout out to Italy in the house. So, praise God. You got black, African, Roman. You got all these different cultures, and they're coming together because this was God's heart from Genesis 12. I will bless Abraham, and I want him to be a family of many nations and bless the whole earth. And we've talked about this in weeks past. God's heart is for the whole world. Jesus is for everybody. That's why in Revelation 5, we see every tongue and tribe and nation bowing down before the worthy throne, the Lamb of God before the throne. And it's reflected right here in Antioch. But then lastly, so the ethnic diversity, um, spiritual diversity, and then socioeconomic diversity, because we see Saul making tents. He was making tents, and he depended, he ma basically made himself poor and made himself depend on the gifts of churches to sustain his life, especially when he wasn't building tents, and you wasn't about to get rich making no tents, all right? So he didn't have a lot of money. But then you see my man Barnabas, he was banking. How do I know that? In Acts chapter 4, the man owned all kind of property. He just told the apostles, look, I'm going to sell a little piece of my property right down the street, and I'm going to just drop it at your feet. He had money. And then you talk about social status. Look at what it says about M Manan. Look at verse 1. It says, he was a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetra. Why is that in the Bible? This word literally means to be raised in Herod's palace. He was like Moses. When it says he was a friend, that's supposed to mean something. When you understand uh, uh, a little bit of the context, when he says this, he's saying, this dude got social status. He grew up in a king's palace. And then the other, you know, the black dudes, they ain't say nothing about them. What's up with them? I don't understand. But they, I guess they didn't have any friends. He didn't say nothing about their friends because you know why? Because they didn't have the status. He's just trying to show you, you got all these different backgrounds. You got ethnic diversity. You got socioeconomic diversity. You, you've got spiritual diversity. And the question is this. This is what I was thinking about. How could this mixed bag of misfits in this new church, how could, how could they survive? I mean, you got prophets and teachers, you got Jews and Gentiles, you got dark-skinned and light-skinned people, you got well-known and unknown people, you've got rich people and poor people all unified to reach their city and the world for the gospel. How can this happen? I'll tell you why Ephesians 2 says Jesus Christ came and broke down everything that could potentially divide us. It's the gospel. It's the cross. Being like Jesus, but you got chocolate and vanilla. Being like Jesus, but you got well-known and unknown. You got rich and poor. You got prophets prophesying. You got teachers explaining. This is the heart of God's church. No wonder they reached the world. They reflected the diversity of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and yet the unity of the Trinity. This is what I praise God for at City of Joy. Different gifts, different colors, different economic spectrums. And I pray, Lord, give us more of this diverse, Antioch-like grace. 
So last, last couple, last couple. The fourth grace of a gospel spreading church is that they are worshipers. Can you say that with me? Worshipers. Look at verse 2. It says, while they were worshiping the Lord. I love this. They were worshiping, man. This new baby church, diverse, just trying to be like Jesus, trying to lock the light-skinned and dark-skinned elbows together just to get the mission accomplished. But I, the love about it that these people in their missionary activity didn't forget that their hearts must burst into holy flames of affection for Jesus. It says they were worshiping the Lord. We see here that the church at Antioch, along with its leaders, gave passionate priority to worshiping the Lord. They were worshiping the Lord, the Lord Jesus. The Lord means boss. They were worshiping Jesus as the boss of their lives. Now that makes sense, Quita. That makes sense. He was the boss. He was the Lord. And he said, go make disciples. So no wonder that when you worship Jesus as Lord, you do what he tells you to do. It says they were worshiping the Lord. And what does it mean? Like America has done something to us. Because I think a lot of Christians, when we think they were worshiping, they think, you know, this is how I fight my battles. Is that the right note? Let me go ahead and, this is, no, that's, no, no, no. We think piano, guitar. How many instruments you see in that verse? Can you just look for me? I I don't, how many solos and praise teams? How much singing do we see? There might have been some going on, but it's not mentioned. One of my definitions of worship that's been helpful for me is all of me responding to all of Jesus all the time with all my heart. All of me responding to all of Jesus with all my heart all the time. I fall short, but Lord, help us to be a church of worshipers where all of us, uh, all of our hearts respond to all that we know of Jesus all the time in every place. And yes, sometimes through singing, sometimes through crying, sometimes through driving, sometimes through set up and tear down. Speaking of set up and tear down, just a pause. Uh, John, think, John Quinley is going to be talking to some of you about set up and tear down as a way to worship the Lord. That's a way of worshiping the Lord, too. What were they doing, though? We get a couple of clues. Follow it with me real quick. Uh, verse 2 says they were worshiping. This word is derived from an old English word. I was thinking about this. The word the word, uh, the, the old English word that this English word comes from is worth-ship. Worth-ship. And Mark already knew that. That brother's like, yeah. So don't look at Mark crazy if he comes up here one day and say, let's worship the Lord. <laughs> don't think it's a list problem or nothing. It ain't. We're going to worship. <laughs> it's not. I know it might sound funny, but worship, it's worth, it, it, it means we're going to reflect the worth of who Jesus is. That's what they were doing. And then another clue to what they were doing is in verse 2, it says they were fasting. Everybody's favorite pastime, right? Fasting. They were denying the physical appetites of their body in order to hunger and thirst for the Lord with undistracted spiritual intensity. Not only were they worship, worshiping and fasting, they were praying, verse 3 says. We see fasting coupled with praying. So these people, when they were worshiping the Lord, man, they were like, I don't want any food. We just want to see God move. 
Put the food to the side. We want to see God. Let's pray. Let's give him all the worth that he deserves. Like when this baby church got together and these leaders got together, they were worshiping the Lord. They decided not to eat. They were crying out in desperate expectation of the Holy Spirit doing something fresh and powerful. Look, is this how we live our lives? Do you worship Jesus? Is he your heart's affection? Does he mean more? Is he more important than food? Is he more important than your favorite thing that you like to do? Is he more important than social media? And all these things, they were worshiping Jesus and they gave him top priority in their affections. This, this, this young church, just striving to be like Jesus. This young church, just, just, um, what else did we say? Striving to be like Jesus. Somebody else help me. Diverse, commissional, worshipers. And the world was changed. And this last point, and we're done. When you lean in like this, and you give up stuff and you're worshiping the Lord, you put yourself in a position to hear clearly from the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit speaks in the environment of Christ exalting worship. No wonder it says in verse 2, the Holy Spirit said. <sighs> Number five. Last grace, spirit controlled. Spirit control. Church, you see it in verse 2. It says the Holy Spirit said. In verse 4, it says the Holy Spirit sent. I just want to close by just sharing four words that begin with a D, and I want to pray them as a closing blessing over our new baby church. It's what we see in these texts. So, City of Joy, may the Spirit control our devotion. That's what we see. Verse 2, they were worshiping the Lord. All genuine worship of Jesus is ignited by the Holy Spirit, not by your quiet time. I know I talk about Bible reading plans and this and that. Look, look, the Holy Spirit has got to ignite your private worship and our corporate worship. May that happen because that's what was going on. The Spirit empowered their devotion, but the next D, the Spirit empowered their direction. Verse 2 says, the Holy Spirit says, set apart for me for the work. Can you say that with me? The work. The work. The Spirit is always moving us to do more gospel work. And so I'm praying that the Holy Spirit would give us direction. Not only that, decisions. May the Spirit control our decisions. Look at verse 2. It says, the Holy Spirit says, set apart for me. Barnabas and Saul. Now, there was a lot of dudes in that verse. But man, we want to, Jose, we want to be leaning into the Holy Spirit so worshipfully that we hear specific directions. Like Mike and Joel. Well, what about Mike and Joel, Lord? Pull them apart. So, wow. The Holy Spirit has specific plans for us as a church in East St. Louis. We want to lean in so we can walk in his direction and his decisions. And then finally, deployments. May the Holy Spirit control our deployments, like a military word, like sent out. Look at verse 4. It says, so being sent out by the Holy Spirit. Yes, I got to close. Somebody being sent out by the Spirit. I don't know who it is. I don't know who it is. He, the brother already told you his phone just came on with a song. The Lord is, that was a good background, sent out by the Holy Spirit. And so we see physical hands were laid on Saul and Barnabas. But verse 4 said the Holy Spirit's invisible hand sent them out deployments. And that's why once a month or so, we want to lay hands on local missionaries. 
Who was here when Mike came up? Let me see your hand. If you were here when Mike came up. Yeah, Mike came up and he shared his heart for Lincoln and he shared his desire to see the gospel penetrate that whole area and we laid hands on him and prayed for him. That's what we're praying, that the Holy Spirit would specifically raise up people, and we're going to lay hands on those in the city. And next week, we get the privilege, like Antioch, to send out our first long-term missionary, not just close, but far to Thailand. Who knows who that is? Riley. So don't miss it. Next Sunday, historic moment in our church. We're going to send out our first long-term missionary. Whether it's Mike at Lincoln or Riley in Thailand, when the Holy Spirit is speaking, he says, set this person apart, set this person apart, put your hands on them, because the gospel's got to get out. The gospel's got to get out. And so, we can actually come and prepare to close The first question I asked was, do you want to see what would happen if the Holy Spirit moved powerfully in a a new baby church, especially their leaders? I want to ask you to pray for the SALT team, the servant leaders of this church. We are planning an all-day Saturday meeting with God and each other where we laugh together, pray together, confess sin together, eat together, play together, and where we worship together. And I want to ask you if you would include into your private prayer time or your joy community time or your family time that you would pray for me and Zach and Mark and Terrence, that you would pray that we would be Christ-like. Just these same things, that we would be commissional together, that we would be diverse. We're praying for a non-black brother on the team. We lost one, but we coming after, I don't know who it is. But I couldn't say this point without actually feeling like, I need, we need to apply this. Like a non-black, non-African-American leader on the servant leadership team to reflect the church that we're part of and the world that we're part of and the area we're part of. So, Lord, send them. But please pray that we will be worshipful and spirit-controlled even as we gather. And so I want to ask everybody to stand. Would everybody just please stand as we prepare to close? And I want to I want to ask you to ask the Lord what he's specifically speaking to you as a sent one. Where is he moving you? What person or people is he sending you to? Has he sent you to? What grace do you need? to be faithful like these Antioch new believers who just wanted to be like Jesus and who locked arms to take the gospel and who just worshiped the Lord and who heard from the Holy Spirit so much so that they didn't just listen, but they actually sent people out on mission. So just take a moment, if you would, and just bow your head and Ask the Holy Spirit what this means for you. Surrender to Jesus Christ. Surrender to what vision and plan and idea he's put in your heart to take the gospel across the street, across the seas. And whatever comes to mind, a few of us will be over to the side and would love to pray for you in Jesus' name.